Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. This is a reading from the book of Isaiah. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of, excuse me, of, the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. He will, they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Stille Nacht, heilige Nacht, O Shiva Hikari. Malam kudus sunyi Чудным младенцем полны их сердца. is an auspicious year in a number of different ways. As we've already shared, this year marks the 200th anniversary of Silent Night. It's also the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And as we said at the very beginning of our service, there's a unique way in which these two stories, anniversaries, connect with each other. Because the song Silent Night figured greatly in the historical episode we call this day the Christmas Truce. The Christmas truce, though, didn't take place in 1918 when the war, World War I, was ended. It actually took place the first Christmas of World War I in 1914. The History Channel gives a wonderful documentary. Most of what I'm going to share is just excerpts of what I learned from watching the History Channel. But in 1914, both sides kind of rushed into the war, each thinking that they were going to make quick work of the other and be back home. But what they found is when they got into the war, they found themselves bogged down in this endless trench warfare. The battle lines extended for 500 miles across northern France. And along that 500 miles, there were just trenches dug by each side. And the, and the battle lines between, you know, the distance between the, the allied forces and the Germans were, were, were only in some cases 100 yards apart the distance of a football field. And yet the gulf was inseparable because you didn't cross that hundred yards. It was known as no man's land. 
because there was barbed wire strung across to slow the, the advancement of any army, and both sides had machine guns trained on the other side so that you would just get mowed down, cut down if you tried to cross. No one was willing, and so both sides just kind of hunkered in, dug in for a long, messy war, and it was a cold and muddy winter. By the time that first Christmas came around, Already in five months of fighting, one million lives have been lost. So Pope Benedict XV issued a call for a truce on Christmas Day. But leaders of both countries rejected that call, said there will be no truce. The Christmas truce did not come by royal edict or papal, you know, like it didn't come from the Pope. It came from the ground up. Uh, Lieutenant Charles Brewer in the History Channel, he tells the story in this way. He says, that night of Christmas Eve, an eerie silence settled over the battlefield. And in the midst of that silence, you know, there was a heavy fog that night, he said, a cry went up from one of his sentries that there was a light on the German front. And he said, I, I peeked my head over the battlements and looked to see and what I saw was a Christmas tree that the Germans had propped up. And he says, I began looking up and down. The, the, the Germans had put Christmas trees at regular intervals all along the battlefront lines. He says, they glowed like, like beads on a necklace. And then in that silence, they began to hear the German forces singing, still a knocked. And even though they didn't recognize the words, they knew the tune of Silent Night. And when they finished singing, the, the British soldiers let out a big cheer, a hooray, right? And then they returned fire, so to speak, singing Silent Night back in their own language, to which they also received a cheer. And so the next morning, as dawn broke on Christmas Day, perhaps emboldened by that exchange of singing with one another, the Germans were the first to come out of their trenches, waving their hands in peace, and when no one shot them, more began to come forward. And then the British, there are some who thought, this might be a trap, don't do it. But others felt, no, this is okay. And so they came forth too, and they met there in no man's land, and they shook hands with one another. Spontaneously, all along this 500 miles, opposing armies made truce with each other. And, and in that space, that day, people did different things. In some cases, they simply reclaimed and recovered the the bodies of fallen comrades. It was unsafe to get before that moment. But in some cases, they uh, began talking and conversing with each other. The, the Germans, for the most part, knew English, and so they could talk. And they talked about how miserable the weather was. And in one place, they said the German soldiers even brought forward barrels of beer that they had stolen from a French uh, tavern nearby. They broke it open and drank, and they all agreed, we have this one thing in common, that French beer is rotten. Uh, <laughs> they exchanged gifts, chocolates, cigarettes, whatever they had. And in one place, uh, they cleared all the barbed wire away and played a match of soccer. Corporal John Ferguson, reflecting on that day, says, we shook hands, we wished each other a Merry Christmas, and we were soon conversing as, as if we'd known each other for years. Here we were laughing and chatting to men whom only a few hours before we were trying to kill. As the sun set on that Christmas day, the soldiers retreated to their respective trenches. And then the next morning at 8.30, Captain Charles Stockwell raised a flag that said Merry Christmas and he shot three times into the air. And after a certain moment of time, the Germans raised a flag that said thank you. And his counterpart shot two times in the air. And they both mounted the pyramids and saluted each other across the football field, no man's land. And then they went back down. And Charles Stockwell wrote, that his counterpart fired one more time into the air and he knew the war was on again. Sadly, the Christmas truce only lasted a day. And by the time Christmas rolled around in future years of World War I, the losses were too many, the bitterness and divide was too deep. There would be no more silencing of guns in Europe until 1918 when the war was ended.
And yet one British soldier, reflecting on that experience, wrote in his journal, I would not have missed the experience yesterday, speaking the day after Christmas. I would not have missed that experience for the most gorgeous dinner, Christmas dinner in England. And Isaiah wrote, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. For that one brief moment in history, Isaiah's prophecy came true. Christ, Christmas, brought peace to earth. Of course, the curious thing about it, the perplexing thing, is why wouldn't the peace last? I mean, how could we, how could people shake hands with, play football with, uh, exchange gifts with one day the enemy and the next day be firing their guns again at them. What, what happens? What's, what's, I, I don't know what this story is really about. Is it about our human capacity to make peace? Or is it about our human capacity to hold on to war? Because I think both capacities are present in every single one of us, right? Right? And, and, and too often, I think we lean into the latter capacity, that capacity to hold on to hatred, to, to, to objectify the enemy. And I say this because here we stand 100 years later, after truce was declared and the, world to end, you know, the, the, the war to end all wars, and yet we are still at war, aren't we? Just as divided... And I find that image of trench warfare to be so profound when you think about it, because we're still stuck in trench warfare. We kind of hunker down with people who think like us and believe like us and want the same things that we want. And just on the other side is, is, is whoever the enemy is. And we may not shoot guns at them, although someplace in the world there is barbed wire and guns and missiles and all those kinds of things, but but, but in our society, in our daily lives, it tends to be more social media and tweets and gossip and sometimes just stone-cold silence that separates us from the other. It's so hard to cross no man's land and make peace with those on the other side. When I think about peace, I think about kind of two dimensions of peace. I mean, the first dimension, I think a lot of times when we talk about Christmas, Sleep and heavenly peace. We talk about the feeling of peace and an inward peace inside of us, a sense of, of calm. Even though things are chaotic, we have peace inside. But there's a second dimension of peace, and that's what Isaiah was speaking about, the, an interpersonal, an external peace, a peace that exists between people or between countries. And he prophesies about this peace. It says, someday we're going to take all these instruments of war, and his day it was... It was swords and spears. In our day, it's guns and tanks and jets and missiles. But someday, all those things will be beaten down and transformed into instruments of care and love. So how does that happen? In my mind, I think these two dimensions of peace are very related to each other. For us to ever achieve external peace... We have to address what is broken in our hearts, what keeps us locked in this cycle of conflict. Because the reality is, is when our heart is at war, we create conflict with those around us. Because the heart that is at war can't see, you know, can't deal with the division and hurt it has inside, and so it externalizes that hurt on others. It blames others, it, it, and it seeps out poison wherever it goes. It, it does damage, and it pulls people into this cycle of violence. One of the best books I've ever read about making peace is, is from the Arbinger Institute, a book called uh, The Anatomy of Peace. And the authors of the book are not identified. They simply call themselves the, the Arbinger Institute, and the book itself is told as a fictional story And yet, I know that the fictional story is based on the realities that happened in the author's lives. And so, when I share this story that's in the book, I know it's based on the experiences of one of the authors. One of the main characters of the book is a guy named Yusuf. And Yusuf is kind of facilitating a workshop about making peace. And he tells a story 
from his own childhood. Yusuf is Palestinian. He says, I grew up, my family lived on the western banks of Jerusalem before the war of 1948 broke out. But when the war of 1948 broke out, in one fell swoop, my father was killed, and I lost my home, and my family fled to Bethlehem for safety and security. He says, so there we were in Bethlehem, and it was a dark time. He says, my role, I, I, I lived on the streets. The way I made money was I would capture the sympathy of Western visitors, because I, I picked up a little bit of English, and I would capture their sympathy, and then I would lead them to shopkeepers that sold kind of souvenirs and trinkets, and then the shopkeeper would give me a cut of whatever groups I managed to bring there. That was how I made a living. He said, and I hated the Jews, because they were the ones who who killed my family, they took our home. He says, but it was a little more nuanced than that because there was one Jew in particular, an old blind beggar that worked the same streets with me. And even though he was Jewish, we felt a kind of a kinship between us. We weren't friends, we didn't really talk to each other, but we, we were in the same line of work, we suffered the same conditions, we, there was an understanding between us. He said, but then one day, while I was working the streets, this old beggar was just down from me, I watched as another man in his haste ran into the old blind beggar, and his pouch in which he collected coins fell to the earth, and the coins scattered all across the street. And Yusuf said, in that moment, I felt the sense that I should help this beggar that I should get down and help him get his coins. I felt it clearly inside me, this impulse, and I turned away. He said, and then speaking rhetorically, asking the workshop that he's leading, he says, so, so when I turned away from the old blind beggar, what kind of thoughts do you think were going through my head? He said, they were thoughts instantly of justification. I was justified in turning away from this man because he was a Jew. He was the enemy. He was one of them. He was one of the people who had taken my father, taken my home. He says, but the thing is, I never thought of that beggar in those terms until that moment. It was only when I turned away from him that he became my enemy. It was only when I turned away and denied my own heart that I had to justify it by making him an object of blame and hate. Only then did I blind myself to his humanity. You see, every act of violence requires justification. And you may say, well, that's not violence. He didn't do anything to hurt the old blind beggar. He just turned away. Well, that's Violence. He had power to help, but, but, but Yusuf's point is that he didn't just do violence against the beggar, he did violence against himself because he violated his own conscience. Andy Crouch defines violence this way. He says, violence is any use of force which does not respect the limits of the object or the person that is, abject, uh, that is acted upon. So if I were to slam a door and say I'm really angry about something, I slam the door harder than it is designed to, to be closed. I don't respect its, its boundaries or its limits. I slam the door and I destroy its dignity. I break the door and, and in the process, what happens to my own dignity? It's probably lost a little bit too, right? Because whenever we commit violence, we damage the dignity of the other person and ourselves. And it doesn't have to just be physical force. That's just one way of doing violence. Violence can be words, especially when from, given from an authority figure, words meant to cut and penetrate and belittle. It can be a boss who is, doesn't see the demands of the people, just sees them as uh, the people who are under him or her, who just sees them as means to an end and keeps demanding more and more and more. It can be sexual harassment, a, 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 an unwanted advance that the other person is helpless to resist. Violence occurs whenever there's an imbalance in power and the person who has the power doesn't see the humanity of the other person, doesn't respect their dignity or their limits. Whenever violence happens, it creates a cycle <clears throat> that begets more, more violence, 
Either the person who is violated strikes back directly or passive aggressively, right? You know, these things kind of play out in our world. But more often than not, they don't strike back to the person who has the more power. Instead, they pass it down the chain to those over whom they have power. And so this cycle just keeps continuing and continuing in our world. So how does Jesus address this? How does Christmas enter the picture? Well, Jesus was born under the reign of Emperor Caesar Augustus. 27 years before Jesus became, uh, entered our world, Caesar Augustus anointed himself emperor of the whole Roman Empire, and historians now call this, he, he instituted what's known as the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But it wasn't real peace. It was only peace if you were a Roman. If you were one of the people over which the Roman Empire ruled, it was oppression. It was suppression of rights. It was a silencing of your, of your voice. It was, a, it was a violation of your territory and your rights and your people. And so the people of Israel didn't experience the, the Pax Romana as a time of peace. For them, it was a time of deep sense of violation. And they began to pray and pray that God would send his Messiah, his anointed one, the one promised in scripture who they thought would rise up in power and with equal violence and force overthrow the Romans. You can see it in Psalm chapter two. This is a, 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 typically a, a prophecy, a song about the Messiah. And it says, I will make, this is God speaking to the Messiah, I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of earth your possession, and what will you do? You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And so the cycle continues and continues and continues. That's what the people of Israel were looking for. But that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus was. With Jesus, the cycle of violence stopped. We see this most clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane when he knows he's about to be arrested, when he knows some of the people that he's perturbed are about to strike back at him. And in that moment, <clears throat> when he comes to be arrested, one of his disciples takes a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the men who are there. And what does Jesus say? No more of this. And then he takes the man's ear and he heals it. Think about that for just a moment. Jesus heals the ear of the man that is there to arrest him and to lead him to his death. You see, Jesus experienced violence. He experienced the worst kind of violence that human beings could ever create. The cat of nine tails, 39 lashes, one more supposedly would kill him. He had his arms and his legs driven to a cross and he was hung there. A crown of thorns pressed upon his brow and while he hung there dying, he, in, he suffered the insults of the crowds who spit at him, who yelled at him, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. And not just the violence of that moment. Many theological traditions affirm that in that moment, Jesus was absorbing into himself all the violence of all of our history, the violence of the Holocaust, the violence of slavery and segregation, the violence of every abuse, every assault that has ever happened. And the spiritual pain was so intense that he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet Jesus met that violence with forgiveness. That he prayed, not just for those who are gathered there, but for the entire human race, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, the antidote to violence is forgiveness. 
Forgiveness absorbs any time that we have ever felt or experienced violation. It absorbs it, receives it, and neutralizes it. That image I put up on the screen earlier of the cycle of violence, any time forgiveness enters that cycle, it stops. It's neutralized, it's done. It has no power to continue. And the beauty of the Christian message is that Jesus Christ died for us all. He absorbed the violence of the human race so that we might be at peace with God and with one another. This is the good news, that you and I are forgiven. And the challenge for us is to receive that forgiveness, to let it soak down into the inner parts of our hearts and our soul, and then to extend it to a world in so need of forgiveness. If we really let forgiveness sink into our hearts, it changes the way we see others <clears throat> because they're no longer our enemy. They're just someone for whom Jesus Christ died, that they might be forgiven. That's hard, but that's our mission to receive and extend forgiveness to our enemy, to our neighbor, to our family, to our spouse, to our children, to our brother, to our sister, and sometimes even to ourselves. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, as that circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder to forgive, because the closest someone is to you the more deeply the damage can go. And sometimes the deepest damage we do is to ourselves. And so be, learning to forgive ourselves, that's the mission. That's the starting point. Frank said, let there be peace. Let it start with me. And how will you know when you are at peace? How will you know when you have really, truly forgiven others? It's when you can be kind. If only in your thoughts, if only in your prayers, when you can be kind to another and wish for their well-being, then you'll know that you've forgiven them. And then you can start the beautiful process of extending peace into our world. So as we think about Christmas this season, all the preparations that I know we're all making, the preparation of our heart, the first preparation that I want to lay before you today is to make peace. In your pews, you have a green wristband. It looks like this. And in just a moment, we're going to have a time of prayer, but as we prepare for that time of prayer, I want you to write on that wristband the name of one person one person to whom you're going to extend peace this Christmas. Don't put the wristband on just yet. We're going to do something in just a few moments with these wristbands. For now, all you have to do is pray about who is God calling you to make peace with. And I encourage you not to write first and last name. Just write a first name or just write a relationship if, if they're related to you and somehow. Frank's going to play some music and in that period of silence, I invite you, or in that period of music, I invite you to reflect, who do I need to forgive? With whom do I need to make peace? If you feel led to pray after writing your name, if you feel led to come at the altar and pray, I invite you to do so. After uh, Frank sings, then we're going to have a, a time of prayer led by Perry. <laughs>